the Bible talks about words and puts words together and you have to pay attention to the quote I mean to the punctuation marks on occasions Paul said I would not have you ignorant brethren now if you didn't have the punctuation that would be bad I would not have you ignorant brethren so you have to be very careful about words and how they're put together. We're glad that all of you are here, and even our one visitor tonight, and he's not really a visitor anymore. Mitchell's been coming for quite some time. We're glad that he's here. I find it interesting that in society today, even among Christians, there are some Bible words that have become bad words. Evil words, words that individuals just do not want to hear. And one of them is the word religion. Everybody today wants to be spiritual, but they want no part of religion. Yet the Bible talks about religion, doesn't it? Pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fathers and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1 Verse 27. There's another word that's interesting, and it is the word sin. People don't sin anymore. Oh yes, we make little mistakes. You can kill somebody, you just made a little mistake. But the Bible talks about sin, doesn't it? Sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. There's another word that we don't use very often today lying. You never hear anybody come out and say, He told a lie. Everybody said, Oh, I think I just misspoke. Yet the Bible tells us very plainly, Lie not one to another, but speak every man truth with his neighbor. There's another word that we're going to be talking about tonight that's a dirty word, that's an ugly word. It's a Bible word though, and it is the word doctrine. Doctrine. I've had individuals ask me this question. Vic, are you one of them doctrinal preachers? As if that's a bad thing. Some individuals will make this statement. We need love today. We don't need any of that doctrine, people have said this, we need to talk about Jesus, for Jesus unites, but all of that doctrine, that's what divides everybody. You know, before we throw out doctrine, we need to do a little bit of study about doctrine and what the Bible has to say about it. So that's what we're going to do tonight. And I've entitled the lesson as follows, A Dose of Doctrine. Because we sure do need some in our world today. We're going to be talking about several points in this lesson, but we're going to cover them relatively quickly and get you out of here. I know you'll be happy to hear that, won't you? I'm just kidding. Notice some statistics about doctrine. The word doctrine is found 51 times in the pages of the Bible. Six times in the Old Testament, 45 times in the New Testament. In other words, it is a New Testament word predominantly, but it's not like the Bible just dismisses the term, or the Old Testament dismisses the term, and not talk about it at all. We also find the word doctrines, plural, it's used five times, and every one of those are in the New Testament. I find it interesting that the very first time we have the word doctrine used, it's found in Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. Moses is talking, speaking forth the Word of God, and he says this, My doctrine shall drop down as the rain. God had no problem talking about doctrine to the children of Israel, it shall drop down as rain. He said, boy, there's a sermon right there, isn't there, about doctrine that we could develop pretty easily. In the Old Testament, even though the word doctrine is only used six times, there are three different Hebrew words that are translated doctrine. In the New Testament, there are three Greek words that are translated doctrine. And since it is a predominantly New Testament word, let's look at those three Greek words for just a moment. 
Not trying to make you Greek scholars or anything, because Vic's show ain't one of those. But the words are interesting. There's three of them. The very first word is this, didache. Didache. And guess what it means? It simply means this, instruction or that which is taught. Does that sound like something evil and bad to you? Absolutely not. Every time this word is used, it is translated by the word doctrine except once. And that's in Titus chapter 1 <laughs> verse 9. They're talking about the responsibility of elders. Holding fast the faithful word, watch this, as he hath been taught. That's the Greek word, didache. As he hath been taught. So one time, it's translated being taught something. There's another Greek word that we read about, and it's the word didaskalia. Boy, you thought that first one was hard, didn't you? Now we're really getting tough. And it very simply means this, teaching or instruction. Every time this word is found, it too is translated doctrine except two times. Romans 12 verse 7, it is translated teaching. Romans 15 verse 4, Paul writes this, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That's this Greek word, the daskalia was written for our learning. That which is taught is to be what? Is to be learned by those who are being taught the Word of God. There's one other term that is translated doctrine in the pages of the New Testament. And it is a word that is very broad and carries with it numerous definitions. And it is the Greek word logos. Sometimes it is translated simply the Word. And Jesus is called that, is He not? In John 1 verse 1. It's only used once as far as doctrine is concerned. And that's Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. And that Word is a lesson all to itself in that particular context. Doctrine. Let's continue to look at doctrine for just a minute. Folks, doctrine is not an evil, dirty, nasty word. I don't care what anybody in the religious world has to say. All it means is teaching, instruction, that which is taught. So let's not throw out doctrine. If we do, we're going to throw out everything that needs to be taught to us. Doctrine is vital and important, is it not? Point number two. Let's talk about Jesus and doctrine. You're going to find some interesting things about Jesus and doctrine. First thing is this, Jesus taught doctrine. If doctrine is a bad thing, if doctrine is an evil thing, then Jesus taught some bad, evil stuff. One of the longest sermons that we have on record is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, is it not? Three entire chapters of the Bible. Matthew chapter 5 through 7. We get to the very end of that particular sermon and the Bible says this in Matthew 7, 28. And it came to pass when He had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at His doctrine. Jesus taught doctrine to those individuals. Folks, the Sermon on the Mount is filled with doctrine. What is it? Instruction. That's all that it is. He keeps going in the Bible in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. Again, we find individuals astonished at Jesus' doctrine. You see, the Sadducees had come to Jesus in this context and they had put up an argument, they thought, against the resurrection of the dead. And Jesus immediately confronts that argument, does He not? And He tells those individuals that they didn't even have an understanding of the Scripture nor of the power of God. He bases His argument upon the tense of a verb found in the Old Testament. God is the God of the living, not of the dead. You see, the tense of the verb is important. Those individuals who died back there in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, guess what? They weren't still dead. Oh yes, they were dead physically. 
But their spirits were still alive and God was still the God of those individuals and is the God of those individuals today. And when the multitude heard these things, they were astonished at His doctrine, the Bible says. His teaching. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. You turn to one simple passage, Mark 4 verse 2, and the Bible says this, And Jesus taught them many things by parables and said unto them in His doctrine. Over and over again, Jesus is a teacher of doctrine, my friends. And if my Lord can teach doctrine, then guess what? So can I. In fact, if our Savior taught doctrine, then guess what? We better teach doctrine ourselves, hadn't we? Here's another interesting point about Jesus and doctrine. Jesus warned individuals against false doctrine. On one occasion, Jesus said to His disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. At first, the disciples misunderstood what Jesus was talking about. They literally thought He was talking about physical bread. Beware of the leaven that the Pharisees and the Sadducees put in their bread. Jesus immediately corrected that and the Bible says this, Then understood they how that He bade them not of the leaven of bread, but watch this, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Folks, think about that for a moment. Who were the two predominant Jewish sects of Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what did Jesus tell His disciples? You better beware of the doctrine of those individuals. Doctrine to Jesus was important. It was important that they had the right doctrine. It was important for them to be aware of the false doctrines that existed. Here's the most interesting text to me. Change that to John 7, 16 instead of 17. My fingers don't type right all the time. But on this occasion, Jesus says this. Listen closely to Him. My doctrine is not mine, but His that sent me. Now I want you to stop and I want you to think about that for a minute. When Jesus came to this earth and He was teaching doctrine, instruction to others, He said, I am not free to teach whatever I want to teach. Now who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus Christ. We're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about the second member of the Godhead. And he says, now that I'm on earth, now that I'm teaching, he says, my doctrine's not mine. It didn't originate with me. It came from the Father which sent me. That's pretty important stuff right there. You look at John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus says this, I speak nothing of myself, but the Father which sent me, He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. When it came to doctrine, Jesus understood how vital it is, how important it is, and He understood exactly from whence it originated. It originated in the mind of the Almighty God. That's pretty good stuff. I could stop right here and have a good sermon. You know that? As far as I'm concerned. I don't know about you. Let's talk a little bit more about doctrine. The Bible says that Scripture is that which contains our doctrine. We're only going to look at three passages of Scripture to prove the point. The first one's found in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, the Bible says. <coughs> My friends, the very reason God revealed this book to us is so that we would have a basis of instruction. So that we would have a platform to teach individuals from. 
so that we would have what God desires for us to have and learn so that we can live the way He wants us to live. It's found where? In this book. That's where it's found. We go just a little bit further in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Very familiar passage of Scripture, especially to preachers. Preach the Word. There's the text. Preach the what? Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. See, I have a responsibility. Oh, I have to be long suffering to you, brethren. But I also have the obligation to make certain that I do what? Proclaim unto you doctrine. But notice how he starts it off. Preach the what? The word. Because it's the word that contains the what? The doctrine that we're supposed to preach. Let's go to one other passage. We've already mentioned the first part of this passage. The duty of elders. And he says this, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Now watch this. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. My friends, there are false teachers in this world. There are individuals who are gainsayers. Individuals who speak against the teachings of the Word of God. And when a man arises... An elder has to be so equipped in the Word of God. He's to hold fast the sound Word so that he can arise when those false teachers start proclaiming their false doctrine and convict them with the precious Word of truth that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayer. My friends, I have no other book that I can go to to teach you doctrine. Our doctrine is found in the pages of this book and this book alone. No catechisms, no manuals, no creeds, no disciplines. This is the book of doctrine for the precious church of Christ. And that's it. Now you and I have some serious obligations and responsibilities to doctrine. But we could just camp out right here for a long period of time. I got four verses for you. The first one's found in 1 Timothy 4 verse 13. Paul tells Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Did you hear what he said? Give attendance to. That little word means this. To turn the mind's eye toward. Give attendance to. I love that. To turn the mind's eye toward. It means to give deep consideration and thought to. It goes further than that. And it means this. To adhere to. One man made this definition of the word. To be attached to. To be addicted to. Man, I love that last one. Folks, we're supposed to be addicted to the Word of God. You know, there's folks addicted to a lot of junk out there. And when you're addicted to something, guess what? You can't get away from it, can you? That's the way we're supposed to be with regard to the Word of God. We can't get away from it. We desire it, we long for it, we want it so desperately every day of our lives. I've got to have the Word of God. Give attention to the Word of God. That's one of our duties, one of our obligations. My friends, we can't be ignorant of God's Word. Second passage. Take heed unto the doctrine. There's another obligation in that passage as well. Listen to what he says. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. Two words. Take heed and continue. That little word, take heed, is an interesting term. It means to grab hold of, to hold on to tightly, to not let go. It's also defined as adherence to and practicing. Take heed, hold to, practice the doctrine. Then he also tells them what to continue therein, to remain, to abide, to persevere, to never quit practicing the precious doctrine of Jesus Christ. Was that what the first century church did? Absolutely. 
Acts 2.42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. My friends, we still have the apostles' doctrine, don't we? Carlos made mention of it this morning, that the testimony of the apostles has been preserved for us, and we still have exactly what they had in the first century. It's just translated, thank the Lord, into English, isn't it? We have what they had, verbatim, exactly identical to what was revealed to those individuals 2,000 years ago. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And now you and I are supposed to what? Continue in that. Never stop practicing it. If the Lord doesn't come back for a million years, a million years from now, individuals ought to be doing exactly what we're doing today because we're doing exactly what they did 2,000 years ago. Notice another text. Titus 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That little word sound is a medical term. We talk about sound health, don't we? Somebody goes and goes to the doctor. I'm not feeling very well. And he comes back and he says, everything's sound as far as I can see. What does that mean? It's good. It's healthy. There's no problems. There's nothing wrong with it. Notice what Paul tells Titus. Speak the things which become sound, healthy doctrine. Doctrine that isn't corrupt. Doctrine that isn't sick. Folks, that implies that there are doctrines that are sick. There are doctrines that are unhealthy. You look at Titus 2 verse 7 and Paul tells Titus this. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. And in doctrine, uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. A man who stands in the pulpit, a man who proclaims the Word of God better make certain that what he says is uncorrupt. That it is totally, completely pure and the Word of God. One more passage. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. Paul is writing to Timothy and says this, I left thee in Ephesus, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Wow. Folks, there's a thousand doctrines out there. There's probably a million doctrines out there. And there was, even in the first century, and Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, I want you to charge these individuals in the city of Ephesus that they teach no other doctrine. My friends, there's one doctrine. There's one truth. There's one gospel. There's one New Testament of Jesus Christ. Not many. And you better teach the right one and not the wrong one. You see, we have obligations and responsibilities to doctrine. Now, this is the ugly stuff right here. Our responsibilities toward false doctrine. I already made mention that there's a healthy doctrine, but there's a lot of false doctrine that's out there as well. And the Bible tells us what to do with those who teach false doctrine. Just two passages. We only need one, but we'll talk about two. Romans 16, 17. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. I beseech you, brethren, watch this, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Wow. Paul gives two responsibilities in that passage that you and I have toward false teachers. He says, you mark them. That little word mark means this, to cast your eyes eye upon, to give attention to, to watch and observe closely and in great detail. My friends, false teachers are dangerous to the souls of men and women. And those individuals need to be marked. Those individuals need to be named. You and I need to know exactly who they are. And Paul tells us, mark them. Let everybody know exactly who those false teachers are. Now, that's not a pleasant duty and most people don't want to hear it today. But it's an obligation that we have toward false doctrine. 
But notice what else he says. He says to avoid them. To deviate from them. To shun them. To turn from them. To turn away from them. Folks, false doctrine is not something we need to be inviting into our homes. It's not something we need to be inviting into our churches. False doctrine is contrary to the will of God. And Paul says, get away from those false teachers. Pretty strong, isn't it? John was even worse. In the first century, it was common for preachers to travel from city to city to city. Paul did a lot of that, didn't he? Folks, you walk into a brand new city, guess what? They didn't have just all kinds of Holiday Inn Express and Hilton's and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times, if they had an inn, it might be very expensive and a man didn't have very much money. And it was the Christian thing to do, wasn't it, that if an individual who is a brother come into town, you need to house him, put him up, show him hospitality. And that was very common in the first century. In 2 John 9-11, through John is writing to a woman who he refers to as the elect lady. Here was a Christian woman who understood her obligation. If a Christian minister comes to town, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to invite him into my house. I'm going to take care of him, give him food, give him a place to stay. And then I'm going to bid him well as he leaves my home. John talks about it in 2 John 9 verse 11. And he says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. Watch this, folks hath not God. Oh, doctrine's not important, really. If you don't have and if you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now watch verse 10. If any man come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. He's talking about the physical home of the elect lady. You don't house a false teacher. You don't bring a false teacher into your house. But what else does he say? Neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Folks, I don't wish him well on his way. I don't wish him prosperity in his mission. I don't tell him, oh, I hope your ministry is successful. Are you kidding me? Here's a man who's a false teacher. Here's a man who is teaching things contrary to the New Testament of Jesus Christ. We'll never, ever, ever wish that man well in anything he does contrary to the truth of the Gospel of Christ. Don't bid him Godspeed. Let me ask you a question. If a woman in the first century was not to bring a false teacher into her physical house, do you think the house of God needs to invite them into their doors to teach and preach? Are you kidding me? No, not at all. Doctrine. It's not a bad word. Oh, I understand that what the Bible has to say about it, people don't like. That's not my fault. You can take that up with God. Because He's the one that's revealed these teachings about doctrine, not me. I'm just teaching them to you. But here's a point that you need to understand, and we really need to appreciate this, folks. Doctrine is associated with man's salvation. You can't be saved without doctrine. We've talked about this passage in times past, and it's just so powerful. Romans chapter 6, 17 and 18. Paul says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. The Romans used to be enslaved to sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now notice they were what? Servants of sin. Now they've obeyed the form of doctrine. Now watch this. Being then made free from sin, then when? When they obeyed that form of doctrine. 
They became servants of righteousness. The form of doctrine, the pattern of doctrine. What is the gospel? Very simply, the gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord, is it not? According to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, or 1 through 4. Jesus what? Died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day. You and I have to obey that form of doctrine. We die to our sins. We're buried in the waters of baptism. We come up out of those waters a new creature. We rise to walk in newness of life. You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. That's the way it's done. What Tim did this morning is exactly what every Christian in this building today has done in times past. We died to our sins, were buried in the waters of baptism, and we rose to walk in newness of life. That's the form of doctrine that frees us from the slavery of sin. But folks, there's another passage of Scripture, and it's the one that we read a while ago. 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. Did you hear what he just said? We've got to continue in the doctrine to save ourselves. You see, doctrine is vital to our salvation. It's very easy for a child of God to look at this book and say, you know what, I'm not doing that anymore. Or it's easy for him to say something like this, I'm not going to do that one thing that God wants me to do and violate the teachings, the doctrine, the instructions of the Almighty God. My friends, we have to continue in them until death. And if so, we'll be saved, will we not? Have you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine? Maybe you need to do that tonight. Have you continued in the doctrine? Does your life manifest that? If not, maybe you need to repent. Confess your sins and ask God to forgive you. Won't you respond as together we stand and sing? Yeah.